partake of uh, the Lord's Supper together. And, um, and I want to uh, read two verses of Scripture from Jude, and that is uh, verses 24 and 25. Verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad to feel the presence of the Holy Ghost? Praise the Lord. And it's okay to worship the Lord with verbal praise. We're not a library. We're a Pentecostal church. Amen. 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 Praise God. Jude chapter, uh, only one chapter, a verse. That's a, that's a habit. It, it's a habit, isn't it? Jude 24 and 25, if you're there, say amen. Jude wrote and he said, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Let's read those two verses together out loud. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, meet us here in your word. We feel your presence. We feel your stirring in our spirits. Come, Holy Ghost. Let this be a service to remember where someone receives the touch that they need so desperately. In Christ's name, I believe you to do that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to share with you for a few moments on Jude's doxology. The little book of Jude is an interesting study. It's the only book of the New Testament that's given completely to the subject of apostasy, which is defecting from real genuine faith. And in these short 25 verses, Jude writes to really... Uh, condemn the apostates and to encourage the church to stand strong and tonight I want to take a look at the closing two verses that we read because as Jude contemplates the work of the enemy he ends up with this tremendous little praise chorus which is really a confession of faith and I think the right word to describe it would uh, would have to be the word doxology because a doxology is really nothing more than a proclamation of praise that comes from two Greek words, doxa, which means glory. Everybody say glory. glory. And logos, which means word or saying. And so we, we see that a doxology is a saying about God's glory, a real proclamation of praise. Now, those of my generation and older, no doubt, are familiar with that word doxology because we often sang the doxology, right? How many remember that? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen? <clears throat> now, as you can tell... Uh, these declarations are, are uh, confessions of what we believe, and in that regard, what we find here in these closing verses of Jude is ap appropriately, I think, called the doxology, and it's uh, really kind of shared with us and pronounced against a very black backdrop or background of all that has been said concerning the last days uh, in the previous verses. And how many know we live in those previous verses of Jude, right? 
uh, as Jude reflects on what he uh, has written and said, he then comes out with this, with this powerful doxology, this, this confession of faith. And notice how verse 24 begins, because there's a, there is such a stark contrast between what has been said and what is now being said that it kind of needs a conjunction there uh, that differentiates between the two, um, that it would read like uh, this, as he says, now unto him. It could also read as but, but unto him. Uh, that is able to keep you from falling. So uh, have, have you, I just was looking at this, and have you ever had one of those experiences of, of getting an image in your mind and not being able to get rid of it? Um, and, and it kind of captures your thoughts and controls you. It is that kind of power that often uh, haunts those individuals, for example, who return from times of war. They'll get images in their mind. And uh, others, uh, maybe a devastating car wreck or accident, uh, someone that's been through a severe trauma. Uh, <clears throat> now, have you ever thought about how that's true, not only in the physical, mental realm, but it can also be true in the spiritual realm? You and I can look around today and see and experience a great many things that can cause fear and panic and uneasiness. But we're also privileged to open our Bibles and read of the beauty and the grace and the power and the majesty of God. And now what I've determined is what we look at will either bring us rest or restlessness. And very often, it is the last look, the image which remains in your conscience or your subconscious long after the object is passed away. And whatever that image is that you have concentrated on, if it's embedded itself, it will either give you rest and assurance or it will give you restlessness and anxiety. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, there are many things that you and I can look at today that are going to cause uh, us to be restless in our culture, things in our church, no doubt culture that can cause folks to get uh, depressed or discouraged. And just read, for example, I thought this week just reading the headlines, listening to the news can almost be a traumatic experience. Things are bad. And folks, they're getting worse. And if a person walks through this world looking only outward, seeing all the problems, seeing all the dishonesty, seeing all the corruption of what's going on, he's not going to be able to have any of the assurance and the rest and the peace that passes understanding and the joy unspeakable that the Scripture promises. The same goes for looking inwardly. As believers, we, we feel this responsibility to be involved and be a part of the solution, and yet it's so many times out of our hands, out of our control. We understand our weakness, and we're outnumbered, and, and values in our culture have been turned upside down. The Bible is ignored. Hello? So looking inwardly, a lot of times that only increases the despair as well. So you look outward, you look inward. So we cannot let the outward look or the inward look be our last look. Or we will be totally discouraged. Amen. So, pastor, what do we do? Well, we need to ask, what did Jude do? What did Jude do? Well, I want to I look at it tonight in the fact that he took an upward look. Praise God. And in the first 20 or so verses, he takes a good hard look at what's going on around him. And it's really a depressing picture. Hello. In vivid detail, he describes the dangers that threaten the church, threaten the Christian life, and that it threatened the fellowship of the church. 
even threaten society as a whole. Jude is a realist. Hello? He doesn't pretend everything is going to be okay, and he'll just think positive and think positive, and it'll all work out. He presents this very real picture of the evils and the, the, the spiritual wasteland and the sinfulness that is all around him and us. He sees all of that surrounding him outwardly. Then he looks inwardly and he sees the innate wickedness and the weakness of every individual. But I'm glad he doesn't stop there. As he closes this little letter, he brings us into the place where there can always be absolute assurance. And, and he ends on a note of victory with this doxology. Now, I want to tell you something. The only person in the world who can walk through this world with all of its problems, with all of its hypocrisy, with all of its dangers, and still end up with a doxology instead of a good dose of depression the only person that can do that is one that has placed their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just be honest with you this evening. If you are a professing Christian and cannot walk through this world, regardless how godless this world may be, if you cannot walk through it with a doxology in your heart, there is something wrong. Hello? And so as Jude ends this letter, he gives us the upward look and he says, all of these things are true. All the things that I have said in the previous verses, things are bad and they're going to get worse. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse. Christ even predicted it all the way through his ministry. The Bible states that the love of many shall grow cold. And, and the longer that this world exists, the colder it's going to be. And the more indifferent and the more wicked. And Jude doesn't stop there. Okay? But he closes out this tremendous letter by saying, But uh, don't let that be your last image in your mind. Don't let that be your last look because unto him who is able. Everybody else is falling and everybody else is stumbling. But I want to introduce unto you somebody that can keep you from falling. Oh, praise God. Every Christian life ought to be a doxology. And regardless of the situation in which you find yourself, regardless of the temptation that confronts you today, I want to tell you something. You ought to be able to meet it all with a doxology and with a confession of faith. So how do we develop that? You say, how do we learn how to do that? Well, Jude shows us how to do it. You interested in finding out? All right, in order to inspire insurance, uh, assurance, not insurance, it's not about AAA. In order to inspire assurance and confidence and rejoicing in, in the church's heart, I want you to notice Jude gives them a vision of God. Oh, how many know a vision of God is a good thing? And he says, let this be your last look. Keep this image in your mind. Concentrate on this image of God as you walk through this world with this vision embedded in your mind and heart. You'll be able to rejoice in the midst of the mess. Now, so let's look at these two verses, and I want us to see what it shows us about God. First of all, he presents God as a sovereign God. Everybody say sovereign and this is most essential. It is indispensable or indispensably essential that you and I, if we are to live in confidence and, and calm, we must see our God as a God of sovereignty. Now, the word sovereignty, let me just break it down. It's a big theological word, but it simply means this. It means the ability to do anything you want to do and do it right. That's what sovereignty means. The ability to do anything you want to do and do it right. That's what sovereignty is. Now, the power and the ability to do anything you want to do and do it right. And the first and foremost thing that Jude reveals to us, the image he wants to leave with us 
about God in this doxology is that he is a sovereign God with absolute sovereignty. Now, there's two things to point out about this sovereignty. First of all, in verse 25, he describes God as the only, what kind of God? Oh, we got to get that a little bit louder. He's the only wise God. Now, underline, first of all, that word only. Everybody say only. God and his sovereignty is seen in his aloneness. He is the only God. You say, now, Pastor, we already know that. Why are you belaboring this point about God being the only God? We all know that. Well, some of us don't live as though we know it. Hello. As a matter of fact, several folks that I know live as though there's two, three, four, five gods. And they seem to think they're in mortal combat. And there's, there's some doubt as to which God is going to be victorious. You see, when you think about God, what do you think of? What does the word God mean to you? What does the word signify? Well, it signifies one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and it signifies one who is in control of every situation. It signifies one who has the last word in every discussion. Hello. It signifies one who's able to keep his word, to keep his promise, and everything else bows to him in submission. Now, a great many of us live as if there were more gods. We live as though sometimes circumstances has the last word in our situation. Listen, we live as though we our own weakness sometimes has the last word in our situation. I think one of the things you and I need to be convinced of in this day is that there is only one God, and He's the only one who is in absolute control of our lives. And he has the last word, folks. He has the last word on every subject. It doesn't matter what the circumstances may be right now for you. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. It doesn't matter at all what the worldly crowd and what the godless culture is doing. It doesn't matter if you've got a teacher at school who denies God, denies the creation. It doesn't matter if some atheist gets on the media program and says there's no God. None of that makes any difference. Listen, there is one God, and He is the only God, and He is the one who's going to have the final say in everything that happens on this globe. And to see that is to see Him sovereign in His aloneness. He shares his power with no one else. Uh, God is sovereign and he is solitary in that sovereignty. So that's the first thing we ought to see about God. He is sovereign. Secondly, Jude tells us that he's not only a sovereign God, but he is a saving God. Somebody can say amen for that. Our King James says to the only wise God, our Savior. Now that's kind of a rare and unusual expression in that we normally don't see God referred to as Savior in the New Testament. It is usually Jesus who is called our Savior. But here it is God the Father who is called our Savior. And I think what Jude is trying to do for us by using the phrase is help us develop a full dimensional view of God. Because we need to see Him as God who is in the saving business. So what does the word Savior mean? It means deliverer. It means one who uh, preserves and protects. Uh, But there's something else about this word that's very interesting because back in the days when this text was written in the New Testament, the word Savior had a very special usage in in, in their culture. We find one example in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. It says, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's suppose that you're living in a little outpost under the authority, a little village under the authority of the Roman Empire. Over yonder is Rome, the headquarters, the seat of the Roman government. From that seat, Caesar rules. 
We live away out here in the middle of nowhere in this little village. All right, have you got the picture so far? Let me try that again. (laughs) Evidently, I didn't draw the picture good enough. But the danger is with you living in this little village over here, you are vulnerable anybody who wants to come and attack your village. All right? So what would happen is if these little outlying villages and communities came under attack, they would send word to the emperor, and the emperor would immediately mount up an army and would come to rescue these distant villages because they did not want to surrender any territory to the enemy. Now watch this. The title they gave to the king or the emperor in those kind of situations was the title Savior. It is used to describe a king who comes to the aid of his outpost. And Paul picks up that thought to say to the Philippian believers, our citizenship is not here, it's in heaven. Our headquarters is in heaven. That's our home. We may be dwelling in the city of Philippi in enemy territory. We are under the authority and care, though, of the king of heaven. And there may be times when the enemy is bearing down on us, trying to destroy us, filling us with defeat. And, and, but he says, you need to recognize uh, that God is our Savior. He's the one who always comes to the aid of those who belong to his kingdom. Somebody praise God for the Savior this, morning, this evening. Praise God. God's salvation comes through Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. And if you think that God is going to save you and deliver you and preserve you without your submission to Christ, you're sadly mistaken. You've got to say, yes, Lord. Yes, God. I surrender totally and completely to you. So that's really all tied up in verse 25. And so we're singing the doxology, so to speak, with Jude of God's sovereignty The fact that he's our Savior. Let's back up to verse 24 and see what that means for us who are living in a dark, dying world. And here we see in verse 24, he's not only sovereign, he's not only our Savior, but notice he's sufficient. Oh, hallelujah. I'm afraid that a great many of us who say we believe in him oftentimes doubt his sufficiency. So if you are tempted to doubt his sufficiency, notice, first of all, Jude says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, he is able. Oh, hallelujah. He is able. That means he is sufficient for every situation that you encounter. Let me just mention two settings in which he is able, because Jude mentions them. First of all, he's sufficient. He says now and ever, right? Those are the two conditions. So first of all, he's sufficient for the present, right? I don't know about you, but that's where I live. I live in the present. I'm not too interested in the past. I have a curious interest in the future, but I live in the present. That's where I really need some sufficiency. And I'm afraid that too much preaching sometimes is focused on the past or on the future. We forget to talk about he's able now. I want you to know that God, who is our sovereign Savior, Jude says he is sufficient here and now. This is really the focus of what Jude is writing. He says, I know I know, church, you're living in hard times. I know you're surrounded by everything that's contradictory to how you're supposed to live. But he said, I want you to know that he's able to keep you from falling. He's sufficient for the present time in which you live. And by the way, the word keep, where he said he's able to keep you, means to watch over and guard you. He's able to watch over you and keep you from literally stumbling. The King James Version says falling, but the word in the Greek literally means stumbling. And that makes all kinds of sense because typically you usually stumble before you fall. Hello? 
So Jude says God is not only to prevent the fall, he can prevent the stumble that causes the fall. Oh, somebody shall praise God. See, the image behind the phrase is that of being sure-footed in slippery places. It's the picture that comes to mind of a cautious rider getting off of his horse and leading it along as they make their way down a slippery, rocky mountainside. Listen, there are times when God comes and blesses us, and it seems like he just lets you fly. He just lets you run. And there are other times where everything just kind of slows down. Hello. And I've often wondered, why, Lord, why are we moving so slow? I'd like to run. Well, God knows I'm passing over some slippery places, and so he takes me very gently and very slowly to keep me from stumbling. Listen, what does that old song say? God leads his dear children along. The psalmist said he leads me beside the still waters. They may be still, but they are still wet and slippery, and God is able to lead me through whatever kinds of circumstances I encounter. And now I don't know about you, but to me, that is a great encouragement because I don't know what's coming. Huh? I don't know if it's slippery or dry. I don't know if there's quicksand or bedrock under my feet, but I don't have to know because my faith is in a God who knows. Oh, praise God. And I don't care how slippery it is. I don't care how treacherous it is. I don't care how uncertain the future may be, how uncertain your present is, uh, if you will just commit yourself uh, to this God that Jude is talking about. Uh, He says he will keep you from losing your balance uh, in this shaky, uh, shattered world. Uh, Listen, he's sufficient for the present. Somebody say, he's able right now. Praise God. Now, He's also, though, Jude says, sufficient for the future. Not only is he able to keep us from falling. Oh, I like this. He's able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, this means we will stand firm and confident in the presence of God on Judgment Day. Now, now, as we ponder this... It might not be too hard for us to stand blameless in front of each other, right? The truth is, we can conceal a lot of things from each other. Oh, help me preach. Huh? Some of us are artists at concealing things. Hmm? See, you don't know everything about me, and I don't know everything about you, and that's why we probably have a lot of respect for each other. Not that I have anything to hide. I don't want you to take it that way. I mean, in this culture, folks, if you live a halfway decent life, you really stand out anymore. Hello? I'm just saying a halfway decent life. You're like, wow, they're like Holy Joe. Come on, I mean, it's, that's how far we've sunk. I mean, if you are halfway faithful to church, you're like part of the elite. If you come to prayer meeting, I mean, Lord of mercy, you're like angel, angel material. But notice he says, You can stand without blame before, not your fellow man, but before God. That's hard to comprehend. Just imagine being able to stand in the presence of the God of all glory. The God before whom all things, the Bible says, are open. And the God who searches the deep things of man's heart. The God who knows me through and through. 
and who is holy and righteous and will not tolerate nothing of unholiness to be able to stand in his presence and his glory and be glad about it. In other words, to be able to say, hey, I'm right here. How you doing? Instead of... uh, Hello. Is this okay? After all, we not only stand without stumbling. He says you're going to be able to stand there with joy. Not just small amount of joy, but exceeding great joy. Judah's telling us that this sovereign, saving, sufficient God is ours. And he's able to do such a work in our lives. He's able to do such a work in your life and mine through Jesus Christ. That one day you and I will be able to stand before those piercing, scrutinizing, gazing eyes of the glory of God. And we will actually be able to stand there faultless without a single spot, without a single blemish, without anything in you that will make you unacceptable. And you'll do it with great joy and you'll celebrate it oh praise God it's not because of what we've done but it's because of who Jesus is somebody shout amen that's why Jude in this doxology he says he is sufficient for the present and don't worry children he'll be sufficient for the future somebody say praise God So now we have here a very simple little secret of how to live in in this doxology. No matter what. And the pattern is right here in this little letter of Jude. I don't care what you're going through. Listen, if you will end every circumstance of your life with this confession of faith you will be able to live with assurance. You may say, I'm going through a hard time. I'm going through a hard time financially, a hard time materially, but unto him who's able to keep me from falling and present me faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy unto him be the glory and the power and the majesty and the dominion forever and ever. Listen, you can substitute any set of circumstances you want to in that sentence. I may be going through a hard time emotionally. I may be going through a difficult time in my family. I may be going through a hard time physically. It doesn't matter what your circumstance. The truth is every possible scenario that comes your way needs to be filtered through this declaration of faith that says but unto him I said unto him who's able to keep me from falling I don't have to fall you don't have to fall you can stand there and say praise God I am saved praise Somebody needs to praise him. Woo, hallelujah. I said he doesn't get any better than that. You better worship. You better worship. He's able to keep me from falling. He's able to keep me from stumbling. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise him, saints. Praise him, church. Praise him, beloved. God has spoken to us. He has not stuttered. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the church say amen. Oh, Lord, you're speaking to hearts. I could go on, but I want to give an opportunity. Is God speaking to your heart tonight? Is God speaking to your heart tonight? Would you like to get a piece about your future like Jude had? The Holy Spirit spoke just a moment ago, and he said, he, he said he's drawn you before, but you've shrugged him off. He's drawing you one more time, one more time, as the musicians come. Father, here tonight, I, I don't obviously know who you're speaking to. But I do know you're speaking very clearly, plainly. And you've challenged our hearts. You're continuing to 
tug at the heartstrings of someone here. And Father, there would be no greater way to conclude this service than to see somebody surrender totally and completely to you. So allow them, lead them to do that right now, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Is there anybody, is there anybody, one, two, or three, that would like to come forward and spend some time in prayer? I'm going to give you that opportunity because the Holy Spirit spoke and gave an invitation. And we dare not ignore it. We dare not ignore it. We should avail ourselves to his call and be obedient. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? We tarry in your presence, O oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pray with me right now, Father. The seed has been sown. Only you can give the increase. We pray for that increase right now. We pray for that stirring. We pray for that conviction. Lord, if there's one, maybe they're responding right now in their pew. Maybe they're crying out to God right where they're at. I pray, oh God. Pour out your forgiveness. Pour out your salvation. Let this sanctuary become a redemption station as you redeem their heart. Oh, as you take that stony heart, that rock hard heart, and you mold it and you melt it and you make it anew. You said in your word you would give them a heart of flesh that can be impressed by the Holy Spirit, that can be moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Lord, do it right here, right now. You can do it, Lord, in a matter of moments. And I invite you to do that as we take a moment and allow your Holy Spirit, oh God, to do that work. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, I surrender. Would you stand and sing it with us? I surrender now to you. I surrender now to you. I surrender now without a compromise. Yes, Lord. Your will is my command. My life is in your hands, oh Lord. I surrender now. One more time, oh I surrender now to you. I surrender now to you. I surrender now without a compromise. my command oh my, my life, life is in your hands, hands. Oh, Lord. oh hallelujah I surrender